Lucky you there. That was easier than it could have been. <laughs> um, I picked 342 because we already had our book open. This makes things nice and easy, and I love this song. Y'all know who the Rock of Ages is? I do. I know him personally. Hey, I don't have my capo, so we're just going to play it in A instead of B. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from the wound inside which flow meet us in the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Could my tears for excited about this one. Y'all, if you can't tell already, I have really enjoyed this study. I've gotten a lot out of it. If nobody else gets anything out of it, praise God I did. Right. <laughs> now this is not the song you grew up singing. They took Ebenezer out of it and a few other words, but it's still pretty and it still applies. Come now, fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sound by flaming tongues of God. Praise His name, I'm fixed upon it. Name of God's redeeming love. Hitherto thy love has blessed me, thou hast brought me to this place. And I know thy hand will bring me safely home by thy good grace. Jesus saw. Mike was here, and he did a really good job, I thought, of sharing with you something most of you have heard all your life about David and Goliath. But there's some, there's some spiritual application to that battle most people don't even think about. And I want to hit on it before we jump into chapter 18, because Goliath is not mentioned in chapter 18. Here's what I want you to know. From a very literal standpoint, David in his youth stood upon his faith in God and defeated a giant. Now we know that. 
We also know he probably had five stones because Goliath had four brothers that will be killed later on in this book. You'll see that. Okay, so Goliath wasn't the only one of that bunch. Apparently they all ate their weeds because that was a big family. Huh? Uh, but here's what I want you to understand. Spiritually speaking, the first big Goliath you will face will require your faith to win. And that first big battle is when you come to know Jesus as your Savior. Your salvation is pictured, spiritually speaking, in that fight. Because think about your sin debt. Your sin debt is so big. Goliath was like nine feet nine or something like that. I don't know. Uh, the Bible says he was uh, so many cubits in a span. I don't even remember now. Like eight cubits in a span, nine. I don't remember. A bunch. He's a big fellow. But think about it in terms of this. Your sin debt is huge. You say, well, wait a minute, preacher. I don't sin that much. It don't matter. We accumulate quite a bit over this lifetime. And one sin's too much. Okay, just so you know. It took one <clears throat> sin. You got Adam and Eve kicked out of the garden and one sin will send you to hell. But our <coughs> sin debt is huge because we just continue to sin against a God that loves us. A God we claim to love. We continue to sin against Him. We don't want to. We don't mean to, but we do. Right? So when you think about what a battle was won, when you ask Christ into your heart, you, by faith, won a huge battle and won a victory. Now, if it was as simple as all that, and that's all a person had to accomplish, think about it this way. Have you ever wondered why after David did what he did with Goliath? Man, he should have been elevated to the point where you didn't have to fight no more. Somebody should have said, all right, he just took out a major enemy. Somebody nobody else wanted any part of. Let's give this guy a job as boss and let him direct from here on out. He shouldn't have to lift a finger no more. He did his part. You ever notice, after we get saved, man, the war's just starting. You think, I got saved, man, now it ought to be easy street. No, it ain't. You have to continue to live and fight battles. Well, David's life is a picture of this. And, and the Lord just showed me this just looking at it. I mean, if you can read it and you can study it and you get the literal understanding of what happened. But think about it from a spiritual perspective. The first great battle we have is to step out in faith and trust a God you've never seen. I was talking to a guy today. I told you his name is Roland. And Roland was telling me, well, if God would just appear and show himself to me, I'd believe in him. That's what he told me. You know what I told him? I said, you've never seen the wind once in your life and you believe it in. I don't have to see his face. I have seen what he can do. He has moved in my life over and over and over and he continues to. You know what floors me? Is when I've done something I know good and well breaks fellowship with my father. And rather than kick me out and throw me away, he comes back and moves in my life again. He's amazing like that. But it all begins with that first victory. We sing a song sometimes. You may have heard of it. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior for one day. No, that ain't what it says. <laughs> no, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew Him. And all my love is do oh, y'all gonna break me out now. Can I call it fit? Oh, I love the Lord. But listen to me. So much is his love for us that he is always ready and willing and able to take care of whatever problem we've got. When David went to fight Goliath, did y'all notice last week? He ran at him. He ran at him. Listen, I don't, if I'd have went at all, my knees would have been bouncing off each other. David, when he says, I, I know we're supposed to be in chapter 18, but I want to quote him. What did he tell him again? He says, I come, uh, oh goodness. Uh, we're we're going to be in chapter 18, I promise I'm getting there. I just want to quote this one thing he said. Uh, here it is. Verse 45, David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God 
uh, uh, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied this day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day of the thousand year to the wild beasts of the earth. All the earth may know there's a God in Israel. This was a huge victory. So was the day that Jesus' blood ran on Calvary because he paid a debt that he did not owe so you can spend eternity with him. So I like to look at that now. If that was all we ever had to do, the Lord would have took us right out of here right then. But we have to continue to live. And that's what we're going to talk about now. Chapter 18, verse 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. I'm going to touch on this because I have to. There's a world of people take this and try to make it mean something it don't mean. And it makes me sick. This homosexual movement tries to claim this verse to say it's okay for men to lay with men, women to lay with women. Friends, this ain't got nothing to do with that. You know, you can love somebody and care about somebody and not have nothing to do with the carnal nature. You can just love somebody. You know how I know that? I love you guys. I hope y'all love me. I hope you love each other. David and Jonathan loved each other. End of story. That's all that means. It just means they clicked, okay? They got along. They were friends. Good friends. Sometimes, sometimes you'll have at least one friend in this life who's a true blue friend who really cares about you. Sometimes you might have two. Some of you may not have any, but I believe most people get to experience that at least once in their life. David and Jonathan were good friends. That's all that means. And I wish people would stop twisting that. But anyway, we'll move on. Verse 2. Saul took him as his own... Uh, I'm sorry. Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Uh, remember, David had been going to Saul to play harp for him anyway because he was troubled by evil spirit. Yes. Which... Uh, some people kind of use as evidence to say he was lost, but I don't believe he was. I just think he was out of fellowship with God. But we'll talk about that another time, maybe next week. Verse 3, Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword, to his bow, and to his girdle. And David went out with us whoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now, a couple things I want to hit on when we move on. Literally speaking, that's what happened. David slew Goliath. It was a major victory. And he does get rewarded for a moment. You ever notice when you get saved, right after you get saved, when you're a baby Christmas Christian, I don't know about y'all, I can't speak for anybody but chat. But for me, it was like somebody opened the door or the windows at least to heaven and we I felt the, as close as I've ever felt to God was right after I got saved. It felt like when I prayed, God just answered right then. You know why that was? Because I was a baby Christian. Think about it this way. When your babies are little, I mean real little, and when they go, wah, wah, one of you, mom, dad, somebody, will run in there and attend to every little need. If, if they need a bottle, you give them a bottle. If they need a diaper, they give a diaper. If they just need to be rocked or hugged or loved or what, squeezed or whatever, you take care of those needs. What happens a year or two later when the same baby goes, wah, Shut up! You ain't hurt. Get up. Dust yourself off. You're fine. Toughen up a little bit. You know, it changes as you grow. You know the same is true with Christianity. When you first get saved, you're a baby in Christ. And of course He tends to your every need. I know He did for me. Every little thing. I would pray things that looking back seem silly now. Like little bitty things. But you know what? God would answer those prayers. And He would strengthen that bond we had. Give me a foundation to build on and begin to grow me in Him. And it's beautiful when you think about it. But as I grew and as I got a little tougher in my Christianity and in my faith, tests began to come. And you're going to see this happens to David too. David here, ever so briefly, has what we might call this honeymoon period with God. Where everything's going pretty good right now. He's made him a best friend. The king is acting like a daddy to him. He's living in the palace. Jonathan's willing to give him his own clothes to, to, to take care of his needs. And that's how it feels when you first get saved. I think there's a spiritual picture of this here. I'm not just drawing it out. I think it's there. Verse 5. I read it already. I read it again. David went out with us, wherever Saul sent him. 
and behaved himself wisely, and Saul sent him over the middle board. He was accepted in the sight of all the people, also in the sight of Saul's servants. Remember, David had the Spirit of God with him. And Christian, you have the Spirit of Almighty, Holy, Righteous God with you everywhere you go. You take the Holy Spirit everywhere you go. If you go somewhere and witness for Christ, you took the Holy Spirit with you. If you go in some bar somewhere, God forbid, you took the Holy Spirit with you there too. Everywhere you go, you take the Holy Spirit of God with you. Because if you're saved, He lives within you. So early on in, in, in David's time there in the palace, he's well received of the people. Verse 6, and where's that scripture that says when a person's way is in line with the Lord, it makes even his enemies be at peace with him. That's someone in the Psalms, I think. Anyway, that's an example of what I'm talking about. Verse 6, it came to pass as they went, David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing, to meet King Saul with tabrets and joy and instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played music and said, Saul had slain his thousands, David his ten thousand. I don't know how the song went. But you know, anybody ever sing, Nan and Nana Boo Boo, the stuff was ten in the world. I just assume it sounded like that. I don't know how it sounded. But just, you know, it don't take very long at all when you become a Christian for the devil to start trying to start stuff. You ever notice the devil likes to start stuff? He likes to just stir up. When I was a kid, my mama called me a pop stirrer. I didn't know what that meant, but she used to call me a pop stirrer. Now that I'm older, I know what that meant. It means an instigator. It means somebody's just trying to keep stuff stirred up. And I'm not, y'all, but I was accused of it when I was young. And I may have even done something. My sister was better at it than I am. But listen, the devil's a pop stirrer. He likes to stir up trouble. And think about it. You hear a bunch of people saying about you. What's going to happen? Head's going to swell just a little bit. The hat's not going to fit quite right. And your attitude's going to begin to change. And you're going to be tempted to act on that type of uh, praise. What will happen is you, you, whether you act on it or not, you'll be tempted to. This is one of the ways the devil likes to come at us. It's called pride. He, he don't, don't feel like it's personal. He did it to Jesus too. Remember when the devil attempt, uh, approached Jesus and said, How would you like to rule the whole earth? I can make that happen. Just, you know, bat out there in portion. See, the devil will do things like this. If he'll try to tempt Jesus, friend, you're not exempt. He'll try to tempt you too. I think there was a whole lot more going on than, than what you just read in verse 7. But just understand, the women would sing about Saul, their king, and they would sing about David with higher praise than the king. Remember, this is just a boy. A teenager probably. A youth. Verse 8. And Saul was very wroth. That's old English for he was pretty mad. Okay? Anger is anger. Wrath or wrath usually is what you do with that anger, typically speaking. And the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands. And to me have they ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? Saul's pretty upset. He said, You know what? They might as well give him the kingdom. They already think he's better than me. Jealousy and envy just lead to more problems, more trouble. Again, the devil's stirring up trouble. You know, this will happen to you. When I first got saved, and I'm ashamed of this, y'all, but I'm telling you the truth. When I first got saved, I went a little while, and I don't know how long it was, where things seemed to go my way. I just felt like the Lord was with me, and I was excited. I was smiling. You couldn't wipe the smile off my face. A little time passed. A little bit of life happened. And I remember being at school. Somebody brought up Jesus. And instead of saying, well, I know him, or saying, I don't know him, I didn't do either one. I just leaned in to listen to see whether the crowd was going to go this way or that way. Because I didn't want to be in the minority. Jesus, who loved me, saved me, redeemed me, and walked with me all those days up till then, gave me an opportunity there to take a stand for him. And I stepped back. I didn't deny him, but I didn't want anybody to know I was crazy. I'm ashamed of that, y'all. See, you get tested. You get tried. These things happen. Hopefully, you learn from them. I have. I'm not ashamed of you. I don't care where we're at. We could be anywhere. I mean, literally anywhere. Name the place. And I will gladly, gladly strike up a conversation about my Savior and everything He's done for me. 
I'm not ashamed anymore. If I didn't do anything else right in this life, I'll learn from that event. That won't happen to me again. I don't care if I'm in the minority. In fact, I'm pretty sure I am. What I care about is that I've learned from that and I just want to glorify my Savior. And you should too. So verse 9. Saul eyed David from that day forward. That's an old English way of saying he kept his eye on him. Now he's worried about it. And, and, and keep in mind, to this point, David didn't do anything wrong. This is just the devil trying to start something. Verse 10. Came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul and he prophesied in the midst of the house. David played with his hand as at other times and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. Now, the Bible don't tell us why he's holding the javelin, but he's got one in his hand. David's playing his harp. He's not hurting anybody. Verse 11, Saul cast the javelin. For he said, probably in his heart, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. Now, friends, David's a braver man than I am. I like once, just one time, somebody started throwing spears at me. I'm liable not to go back where that occurred. But you know, David knew something that most people don't realize today. The world we live in is so jaded because nobody will tell the truth. Nobody will go on national news and tell the truth. They won't say there's principalities and powers and darkness and the rulers of darkness over this world currently. And there are things going on that are just directly ascribed to Satan and his minions. And they won't stand up and say that. But I think David understood that there was an evil spirit in the room and he kept going back anyway because he had more faith in God and more care for Saul than he had fear of this demonic presence. And we could use a whole lot of that right there in America today. We could use men who will stand up in faith, trusting God, instead of worrying about what somebody else is doing or the evil in the world. I know people right now who won't go out and witness to other people because they're afraid they'll get stabbed or shot. And I understand that it's a real threat. But don't you think those disciples followed Jesus until he was crucified, had those same things to worry about when they went when they went spreading the gospel, adhering to the Great Commission, even in the face of certain death, and every one of them but John was martyred for their faith. Nobody's asking anybody in this room to be martyred for your faith. But should you be asked, would you? Nobody's, nobody's asking any Americans, as far as I know, to lay down their life for their faith. All I'm asking is that you make yourself a little uncomfortable once in a while. Get out of your comfort zone and do something for Jesus. I've never one time asked anybody uh, that would listen to me to lay down their life for Jesus Christ. Just maybe make an attempt to talk to somebody. But David here apparently continues to go in there and deal with Saul. Verse 12, and Saul was afraid of David. Now wait a minute, who was throwing the javelin here? <laughs> Saul was afraid of David. That's, uh, that's interesting. Saul was afraid of his own shadow, if you're being honest. He was a very weak character man. <clears throat> he was afraid of David, look at the other half of that, because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. This reminds me of a scripture in the New Testament. I think it's Matthew 16, 18. But there's that famous verse that says, The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church which a lot of people misunderstand, and I've told this before, that's an offensive statement, not a defensive statement. It's an offensive statement. It means when you go and you stand for God, the gates of hell who are on the defensive can't keep you out. That means you can almost literally march right into the flames of hell and start dragging souls out of there, and the devil can't stop you. He can't stop you because you have the power of Almighty God with you. That's what that means. A lot of people read that verse and think, well, we're safe in here in this church and everything because the Bible said the gates of hell will not prevail against God's church. That's not what that means. Gates typically don't travel with the enemy when they march. They leave them things at home, right? When the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail, that's, a, that's an offensive statement. That means we go out. We're going to do what God told us to do in the Great Commission, which is, go ye therefore into all the world, teaching all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. 
And the best part is, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That means standing as David did, with faith, we should be able to go and do what God called us to do. And if you do it right, they'll be afraid of you. The devil won't admit it, but he's afraid of God. The devil won't admit it. He's afraid of you when you're in the will of God. And let me share one more thing with you you didn't know. This is why I was never scared of COVID. If you're in the middle of God's will doing what God called you to do, you're immortal until he's through with you. Let me say that again. If you're in the middle of God's will doing what he called you to do, you cannot die until he's through with you. You don't have to worry about somebody killing you. They can't take your life until God allows them to. You remember, Job wasn't permitted to be killed because the devil wanted him dead. The devil can't do anything God don't let him do anything. And so it's interesting to me, Saul's afraid of David. Verse 13, Therefore Saul removed him from him and made him his captain over a thousand and he went out and came in before the people. Let me put that plainly. Saul said, well, I'm scared of him. I've thrown a spear at him twice. I can't even hit him. I just get him away from me, get him out there where somebody else will kill him, and he'll die in the natural course of things. I'll put him on the front lines with a whole bunch of men, make him think that I'm promoting him, and let him die his own way. Sometimes the Lord does this in our Christian walk. Sometimes after we're saved and we're past that honeymoon period, sometimes the Lord will send you out to do a particular thing he called you to do. And sometimes it's going to get hard. And some people, especially Americans, will say, I don't do this no more. This ain't much fun as I thought it was going to be. I wasn't called to have fun. I was called to preach the gospel. I was called to teach the Bible. I was called to stand up for Jesus. I was called to do good in a dark world. And so were you, for the most part. We're ambassadors for Jesus Christ. I've never met an ambassador yet that just stays home. That's the reason they're called to be ambassadors, because they go somewhere else with whatever they're representing. And we're supposed to go somewhere else with Jesus Christ. So David sent out of the presence of the king, verse 14, David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. You know, a lot of people, once they get away from whatever church sent them out, or a lot of people, when they're not in church, not in the Jewish Wednesday, in the middle of the week, they're out away from church, they're not behaving themselves. Did y'all hear me? There's Christians out here in this world not behaving themselves. And then they wonder, who God won't answer my prayers. I don't know where he's at. I know where he's at. He's watching you not behave yourself. I can pray that. Listen, stop talking about being a Christian on Sunday. Start living like one on Monday. That's what you're supposed to be doing. David was doing right in Saul's house. David was doing right when he was sent out in the middle of nowhere where he could have got away with stuff. The Bible says he behaved himself. My mama used to tell me, and she meant it, behave. I just went in here with me all the time. It'd be a better country if everybody just behaved, huh? Verse 15, wherefore when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. There's a theme going here about being afraid of him. I'm trying to get somewhere, so I'm going to rush along. I may come back. Oh, I'm, I'm, this is a disclaimer. For those that don't like me going backwards, I can't cover all this tonight. I'm going to come back to some of this. So look for that next week. But I'm trying to get somewhere, so let me get there, and I'll come back later. All right. Verse 16, all of Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. He was the face of the nation because he's who they saw. He didn't hide in his basement and try to campaign from there like some people I won't name. Verse 17, Saul said to David, Behold, my elder daughter, Merib, her will I give thee to wife, only to be thou valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul said, Let not mine hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistine be upon him. So he made him a bunch of promises, and the devil will do that. The devil will promise you stuff he can't deliver on. And I'm not saying Saul's the devil, but he worked for him every now and then. Verse 18. David said to Saul, Who am I? What is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? This is where I was trying to get. And we're going to cover this from here to verse 24. I want to talk about this for a minute. Do you see David's humility here? Most Americans need to eat a great big humble pie. They need to remember who it is they're a child of. Who are we that we should be daughter-in-law to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Let me explain that. Did y'all know the church is the bride of Christ? 
if the church is the bride, who's the groom? Jesus Christ. So who are we daughter-in-law to? I love what David says here because he, he makes a very good statement. He says, who am I? What makes me worthy to be an in-law to the king? Listen, I'm going to tell you something. You know what made David worthy? The same thing makes you and me Faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Him alone. Trusting in Him. See, I'm not worthy to be an in-law to the king. I am not worthy to be in the family of God. But you know what? He didn't allow me in because I'm worthy. He just loves me. He loves you too. He loved David. And he even loves Saul. But if you're going to love him back, there's going to be some action involved. Let me tell you something that the world won't tell you. And I'm going to help some of y'all. Okay, listen to me. Love is not a feeling. Get that out of your mind. The world is beaten into our brain that if you feel a certain way, then you're loved. Or you're giving love if you make somebody else feel that way. That is homage. Homage. Love is not a feeling. And it's not something you turn on and off like a light switch. Well, I just don't love you anymore. If my wife and I stayed married based on a feeling, we wouldn't stay married at all. It would have been over a long time ago. Who knows? It still could be. To be continued. But here's what I know. It ain't a feeling. Love is an action. It's something. It's a choice. I choose to love all of you even if you hate my kids. I've just decided. I've told some of you. I don't care what you do to me. I'm going to love you from now to the grave. If you shoot at me, I'm just going to have to dodge bullets while I love you because I love you. That's the way it is. That's love. Unconditional. You can't earn it. I love you. You can't make me not love you. So quit trying. I love you. And if I can do that in my weakness and my frailty, how much the more can God do? He loves you. You just can't wrap your brain around how much. You can. I can. But He does. And David understands that He's not worthy but he also understands worthy or not. That's the situation. I'm going to have to cut it off. I don't want to. I'd like to get down to verse 24 where they have a very similar situation mentioned. But let me just close with this thought so we can get to this other presentation. Let me close with this thought. If you'll study your Bible with an open mind, stop reading it as though it's just saying this. There's so much more in Scripture than you see at face value. And I was telling Brother Mark this earlier. There is what you call perspectives that change. I've told this before. I'm going to tell it again as I close. This is just an example. I could give you a hundred. I'm going to give you one. Just one example. I have told you all this, but I read The Prodigal Son when I was a young man. I was probably younger than Justin is now. And I read that out of my Bible. Nobody, I didn't wait for somebody to tell it to me. I read it for myself. And I did what most people do. I read about the prodigal son. I thought, ooh, I know how that feels to be the boy that just acts this way and then realizes they done messed up. You got to go crawling back to that. He's a young boy. I recognize that. That's a perspective that I saw as a young man. I got a little bit older, a little bit closer to God, and I read it again. Same story. They didn't change any of it. Did y'all know that? They've never changed the story. Not one word of it. It's been the same every time I read it. But I read it again later and I understood how that older brother felt. I thought, you know, I've been serving God a while now. And I'd be hot. Just hot. If somebody else supposedly serving God just took off and lived any way they wanted to and thought they just going to come back like nothing happened, I'd be upset. I'd, I'd just be a little indignant. So I read it again. I saw that. I understood that. It made sense to me. Then I got a little older and I read it again. And believe it or not, it was the same story again. But when I read it that third time, I got to think about the daddy. I got kids. I don't want to know how it feels for one of them to run off and not come back. I don't want to know. But I can imagine. I can imagine how that must feel. And then I got a little older and got the ministry and I read it again. Did you know there's a fourth perspective to that? There's the 
younger brother, the older brother, and the father. And then there's God's perspective. And here's what I mean by that. How did that young man know he could go home? How did he know there's a home to go home to? I read The Greatest of Wrath. Sometimes homes move, especially during the Depression. Sometimes when money's tight, they sell the farm, and your parents move to town. They move into a condo somewhere, or worse yet, into a nursing home. Sometimes change is inevitable, and you can't just go home. You know how much I'd like to just go to my mom, crawl on her lap, wrap my arms around her, say, Mama, just hold me alone. I can't. She ain't there. How'd that boy know daddy's still there? You know why? Because there's another picture there of God who changes us. And he said that, by the way. He says, I change not, therefore you sons of Jacob are not concerned. It's because he don't change that we can rely on him. See, the world changes. In 2023, you hear that a lot. Well, you got to get with the 21st century, Brother Chad. We're doing it this way now. You do what you want to do. God don't change. And I'm leaning on him. I don't care if they say it's okay to shout him. I don't care what they say. I don't, I don't care if they say it's okay to dress like a cat and use a litter box at school. I don't care what they do. I'm only on God. God don't change. His opinion don't change. His ways don't change. And more importantly, His love don't change. That's what all my faith and hope is resting in. All right, I've gone further than I meant to. Anybody have anything to add or ask or say before I close for the prayer and shut the video off and move into the other room? Anybody? Anybody? We're going to have a word of prayer, and then those that want to, we're going to move in there and let Brother Gary show some stuff to us. If you don't have time, fine, but you won't get another chance. It's going to the museum, you won't get to see it. So I encourage you, if you've got the time, stay at least a little while and see what he has to offer. Father God in heaven, thank you for your love, thank you for your word, thank you for the example given us in Scripture. Help us to open our hearts and minds to study it anew. Lord, show us something new in it every time we look at it. And thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for Jesus. Yeah. Uh -huh.